Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me. I think uh, my talk is going to be uh, a little bit more, uh, more clinical, but there is definitely points of conversation. And I couldn't start my talk without showing you my t-shirt that says, smoke risk it, not meth. This is one of my colleagues that just gave this to me last week. So okay, where did you get that? Um, I don't, I'll find out from her. I'll find out from her, but it's, uh, it's I should have worn it this morning for you guys. Um, anyways, um, you know, what I like to do is, is maybe start off with what pulmonary hypertension is as a broad overview, where uh, drugs and toxins and methamphetamines fit into it. Um, and then talk a little bit about uh, the primary data set that from our database. Um, so pulmonary hypertension is really viewed as uh, mostly the group one pulmonary hypertension, a rare uh, cardiopulmonary disease that predominantly affects women. And uh, we don't fully understand why that is. There's some work that Steve is doing to address that. Uh, Rohan, I, I hate to inter interfere, but can you make your, your slide bigger? Okay. Are you seeing, let me, are you seeing the speaker slide or are you seeing the um a single slide are you seeing i think we're slides? seeing the the single slide but it's small so huh. I think it might have to be the oh, hold on it's on our end or no it's no, yeah i, I need think to you go have to be in the slide view do you have the slide view up yeah let me show it to you again Tell you what, one thing I could do is, do you want me to email my slide deck to Sherry? And you guys could put it up from there. There, that's better. We got you. All right. We got it. All right. Um, okay. So um, you should also see a laser pointer now as well, right? Yeah, we can see the laser pointer. Okay, great, awesome. So it's uh, pulmonary hypertension is a rare cardiopulmonary disease predominantly affecting women. Um, the disease is felt to originate within the pulmonary vasculature and the schematic on the right-hand side attempts to show the differential uh, amounts of pulmonary vascular occlusion or arteriopathy uh, that leads to complete obliteration of the distal pulmonary vasculature uh, and really uh, the mechanism for death for these patients uh, happens to be by right heart failure, uh, initially potentially uh, hypertrophy and then thinning out of the right ventricle and, and failure of the, of the right ventricle. Of note, I think we know that methamphetamine also affects myocardial function, specifically LV function. So we'd be going back and forth on that. There are some very specific hemodynamic definitions of pulmonary hypertension. Um, and we can get into that. Um, there are recent changes, but predominantly we stick with a mean pulmonary artery pressure of more than 25 millimeters of mercury as being diagnostic. And we, uh, with pulmonary vascular disease associated pulmonary hypertension or PAH associated uh, with methamphetamine, we like to make sure that the left ventricular filling uh, profile is as normal as it can be. So our definitions usually require a wedge pressure of less than 15 uh, millimeters of mercury or so. Um, in, in, in the overall scheme of things, pulmonary hypertension is characterized in five distinct um, uh, classifications, but we'll be focusing on group one pulmonary arterial hypertension, where the disease is within the pulmonary vasculature. And you'll notice that group 1.3 is is labeled as uh, drugs and toxins induced. Um, there will be potentially overlap with left heart disease with patients who uh, use methamphetamine, chronic lung diseases such as uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that may come into effect uh, with uh, smokers uh, who smoke tobacco and uh, use uh, methamphetamine, chronic thromboembolic disease uh, from pulmonary embolism and multifactorial mechanisms. But this is sort of an outline of how we approach clinical classification and our thoughts about um, you know, phenotyping uh, clinically pulmonary hypertension patients. Based upon uh, our work and, and um, certain other studies, um, 
it is now recognized that illicit methamphetamine is, uh, you know, a definite cause of pulmonary arterial hypertension. There are other historical um, um, causes of note here as well, and I'm going to show you a timeline of those. The most famous being uh, uh, stimulant um, appetite suppressants, uh, such as Aminorex and the fen fen fenfluramine, fenteramine epidemic here in the United States in the 1980s and the 1990s. But uh, just recently, uh, methamphetamine has been uh, really, uh, you know, uh, um, accepted as uh, a definite cause of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And to speak to a little bit of the patho uh, mechanism, pathobiology, um, I know Studi and Venezia will talk more about this. The feeling that um, in general that we have, the hypothesis is, is that it's a second hit um, uh, uh, issue, that there is some uh, epigenetic, genetic uh, predisposition or other factors that predispose uh, the development of this uh, occlusive pulmonary vascular disease, along with the environmental exposure. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, anorexigens, it's been shown that uh, patients who have anorexigen-associated pulmonary arterial hypertension with aminorex or fenfluramine have a higher prevalence of the single uh, most identified um, and highly recognized uh, mutation that's associated with pulmonary hypertension, that of the bone morphogenic protein receptor 2, which has nearly 150 different mutations that have been found in patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension and, and is recognized as a heritable cause of pulmonary vascular disease. Benicio and I in 2012 saw a woman who had, later we identified an endoglin mutation that's typically associated with HHD disease, uh, but without any pulmonary AVMs, who um, got, you know, the wrong way and started using methamphetamine for several years and, uh, and then developed pulmonary vascular disease. And this was a sort of a case example for us to suggest that uh, there is this potential underlying, um, you know, um, uh, predisposition. And we know that uh, ALK and endoglin uh, mutations are now associated with the development of pulmonary hypertension, maybe methamphetamine was that environmental trigger for that person to develop uh, the, the pulmonary vascular disease. Uh, feel free to stop me at any time for any questions, but uh, we couldn't talk about uh, methamphetamine without recognizing the relationship of other agents. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the field of drug-induced pulmonary hypertension really peaked with the recognition that aminorex in uh, Central European countries was associated with a spike in what was known then as primary pulmonary hypertension in the mid-1960s, uh, and that led to the withdrawal of aminorex. The, in Spain and certainly in the U.S. In, in the 1980s, there was the toxic oil syndrome uh, associated with tainted rapeseed oil that uh, developed a um, hemorrhagic pulmonary disease and pulmonary vascular disease with eosinophilia. And in um, the early, in the late 1990, or mid 1990s and into the 2000s, um, several different studies, including uh, one uh, uh, published in the New England Journal, identified uh, fenfen, fen, uh, and fenfluramine specifically itself um, as being associated with the development of pulmonary vascular disease in patients who were using it as a weight loss agent. And interestingly, uh, more than three months of use of uh, fenfluramine or fenteramine was associated with nearly a 20-fold increase in the uh, odds of development of pulmonary hypertension in the ensuing years uh, in these uh, mostly uh, uh, women uh, who, were, who were using it as a weight loss weight loss agent. And it, that resulted in the withdrawal of fenfluramine, fenteramine in the 1990s um, uh, by the regulatory agencies. And later on in, in France, especially uh, this weight loss agent called Benflorex has been associated uh, with, uh, with that. So, so we consider this sort of um, wave of uh, methamphetamine uh, uh, abuse that, that we have really read about, um, recognized at least um, by us um, or by the literature uh, in the mid 1990s 
um, as, uh, as being something of interest in terms of a drug induced. The first case of methamphetamine associated uh, pulmonary hypertension was described in a 33 year old truck driver who had a 10 year history of amphetamine inhalation um, and um, resulting in um, uh, pulmonary hypertension and ultimate death from right heart failure. This was reported in 1993 in, in the journal Chess, and um, not until 2006 was there a um, smaller uh, study, a case control retrospective study uh, that looked at exposure to any stimulants. And uh, the limitation of this study was that uh, it really included cocaine, um, uh, amphetamines, and, um, uh, and other stimulants, um, or a combination of these stimulants in uh, um, San Diego, uh, UC San Diego, uh, and, and looked at the association of exposure to stimulants um, and uh, development of pulmonary hypertension. And in short, what they found was um, when they con compared patients who had idiopathic or no known cause of having pulmonary arterial hypertension where, versus associates, you know, those causes that I really didn't much talk much about. We know that HIV itself is directly linked with the development of pulmonary hypertension at about uh, one in 200 patients, uh, scleroderma patients and autoimmune disease patients for um, a variety of uh, reasons have uh, association with developing pulmonary hypertension uh, and, and other associated conditions like liver disease. Uh, when they compared uh, patients with unknown causes versus causes of PAH, they showed that there was um, nearly a tenfold higher uh, odds of um, demonstrating this link to uh, stimulants. And, and patients with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension versus idiopathics, they saw that when you make that comparison, the idiopathics were, uh, uh, you know, nearly uh, eightfold higher, uh, you know, um, uh, adjusted uh, for gender, age, and race of, of having um, uh, association with um, with uh, use of any stimulants in the past. Uh, obviously, this was a retrospective study, but it and it was limited to most uh, 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 stimulants. Um, but it really, um, you know, got us um, got us thinking. Um, here at Stanford, we we have been um, lucky enough uh, to um, have a support for a database that started in two thousand and one. And one of the main goals of that database was to identify uh, and characterize the disease course of methamphetamine-associated PAH. To her credit, my, uh, my mentor, who was um, really the founder of the adult program, um, really saw the, this wave of amphetamine abuse coming and presenting to our center uh, these patients who were chronic uh, meth users and really wondered uh, you know, how we could study this, um, uh, this issue. The hypothesis that we began with uh, was that methamphetamine-associated PAH may present as a more severe uh, phenotype. Maybe these patients have uh, limitations to access to care or um, are hesitant to seek care, having later referrals to this specialty program. Um, and, and we wondered whether uh, methamphetamine PAH patients, as we we're seeing, had a poor prognosis uh, compared to idiopathic disease patients. Uh, primarily because of maybe other factors, maybe socioeconomic circumstances, access to care, or was there a uh, direct uh, impact on, on cardiac function? So uh, using our adult pulmonary hypertension uh, database, uh, we have nearly uh, a thousand patients that we could study at the point of uh, when the study uh, sort of to begin uh, its analytic pathway. Uh, we, we wanted to compare idiopathics versus methamphetamine patients who had been seen at Stanford between 2003 and, and 2015. We identified data from 187 patients uh, in our database, and uh, we considered, um, you know, this is one of the opportunities uh, for us to understand what a significant exposure to methamphetamine in, in cardiac and pulmonary toxicity uh, could be. We, we we based our uh, lifelong, lifetime exposure of more than three months on the IPPHS study that I mentioned to you in the New England when, where uh, MNRX or, or actually fenfluramine uh, was, um, 
you know, seen to uh, uh, cause uh, or be really associated with significant pulmonary vascular disease if it was used more than more than three, three months. We did our best to uh, exclude all cases of concomitant anorexogen and stimulant use. Um, you know, these are all interview physician-based questions. Um, uh, most of our toxicology is urine toxicology, but we didn't capture uh, well uh, the coke, uh, you know, concomitant use of uh, other drugs, uh, um, uh, primarily cocaine. We don't uh, believe that there is any uh, link with cannabis. Uh, we certainly didn't look at that either. Uh, so uh, I'll show you data in terms of um, our approach in comparing these two cohorts and looking at event-free survival. We did the Cox proportional hazard to look at uh, uh, univariate and multivariate models to look at outcomes. Um, and and we, we did what we could with uh, purposeful addition of covariates to look at potential confounders uh, and look at mediation and proportion of treatment effect analyses to identify these mediators and the degree of their effect. I'm not going to talk about HCUP data, but I think that that's essentially where we'll end up going with this conversation about what the real epidemiology of uh, pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular disease associated with methamphetamine is. And, and I'll end up on, on that note with our, um, with our um, proposed um, clinical uh, trial or, or, reg, uh, or uh, case control study that we're, we're gonna be doing that Steve and I are leading. So uh, in our database, we basically started with these near, uh, nearly 900 pH patients uh, and um, basically uh, honed down on 97 idiopathic PAH patients and about 120 drugs and toxins associated PAH patients uh, of whom uh, we excluded uh, nearly 30 because of other concomitant illnesses. We did exclude concomitant HIV uh, because you know the question here was just directly linking uh, the relationship between methamphetamine or comparing the outcomes of methamphetamine and idiopathic disease. But I think that's going to be a growing topic of conversation for us and how do we uh, peel away that component that HIV disease has uh, potentially and associated with pulmonary vascular disease and separate that out with methamphetamine. Um, one of the um, major uh, you know, advantages of, of this is that we had um, you know, it may not seem huge, but for a rare disease, we view it as huge. About uh, eight, uh, 9,000 patient months of follow-up, median observation time of about 47 uh, months, and we had no subjects lost to follow-up. We accounted for all the subjects at the end, um, at the end of the study. So um, here are the baseline clinical and socioeconomic status uh, uh, of the uh, PAH, uh, methamphetamine PAH patients. And I hope that this is not too small, but I'll go through them and highlight the uh, major important points. Interestingly, while idiopathic disease is associated with mostly women, as I mentioned to you earlier, methamphetamine uh, appears to be uh, nearly equal, if not a little bit uh, uh, strong, more strongly related with, um, uh, you know, uh, with the male, male gender. Uh, we saw that uh, most of our methamphetamine using patients, sorry, let me turn down my phone, um, were uh, white, non-Hispanic. Non but there was no difference in terms of the symptom onset to the time of diagnosis, uh, which really shot down this issue for us that uh, these patients were not seeking uh, medical care um, uh, quick enough, uh, if you, you might say. We used the New York Heart Classification to characterize symptoms of heart failure and uh, methamphetamine patients certainly reported higher, uh, more uh, symptom uh, scale on at the time of presentation of New York Heart Class and Class 3 and 4 uh, disease. Um, but one, one of the things that was very surprising to us, and hopefully this is not um, obstructed by uh, um, anything on the screen here, that uh, county level characteristics of these patients were uh, much more similar than we anticipated. The median household income, uh, uh, percent of residents below poverty and in in educational levels, even though their 
they appear to have um, some uh, some statistical significance in terms of the differences. Uh, these numbers were, were you can see here on the screen uh, very very uh, uh, close. Majority of the re uh, these patients with the methamphetamine associated PAH had uh, achieved a, um, a high school uh, minimum, a high school degree, and also a, a, um, similarly to idiopathics, a college degree. Uh, one of the ways that we characterize the disease, as I mentioned to you uh, in the uh, in the introduction, is is looking at the effect of the disease on on cardiac size and function. This uh, group that we studied are predominantly patients with pulmonary vascular disease, but we know from the literature there is a high prevalence of cardiomyopathy associated with methamphetamine use. Uh, but the majority of our patients had very similar uh, cardiac uh, LV size function um, and, um, uh, um, and, and uh, essentially uh, we viewed that as fairly um, uh, insignificant in terms of the differences. But what we can see is that patients with methamphetamine abuse have a more dilated um, uh, proportion of right ventricles at time of presentation and the function is uh, worse compared to to the idiopathics. Um, as I mentioned to you before, this disease is a hemodynamic definition um, and, and most of the hemodynamic parameters, including the cardiac output and pulmonary vascular resistance were similar across the two cohorts. It's so the severity of the diseases uh, from a pulmonary vascular perspective is not really uh, you know, uh, different between the two cohorts. Uh, I love these pictures. It's just that's what they are. This is basically the panel A is uh, a, someone with a normal pulmonary uh, vasculature and no pulmonary hypertension. You see a very uh, sort of uh, uh, straight um, and um, uh, well um, uh, sort of uh, di uh, diverting pulmonary vasculature. You could follow the pulmonary vasculature to small daughter branches here in the um, in the window here, and at the level of the resolution of uh, pulmonary angiography in the cath lab, uh, there is no uh, sort of monopedialization, if you will, of vessels, meaning that each vessel leads to at least two daughter branches. Whereas in idiopathic disease, both in C and D, and also in, in methamphetamine disease, what you're beginning to see is uh, a very rapid narrowing of the pulmonary vasculature compared to a normal one. You see that uh, even before the loss of resolution in, um, in, in this uh, uh, image and others, uh, there is uh, only single vessels coming out of, uh, and, and the branching is, is, um, is really is, is really changed. So um, this, this is a way that we can phenotype patients uh, from an imaging perspective, but unfortunately, we also have histopathology that we can show. So panel A is um, a normal pulmonary art, art, uh, artery or arterial where there is a very small uh, layer of, of muscularization. There is a wide and patent um, lumen. And panel B is, is one uh, from a patient with, um, with uh, idiopathic PAH. You see that there is near complete obliteration uh, of the blood vessel by uh, invading cells from uh, what we call the neointema and the channels of blood that are sort of, um, sort of distributed throughout this occlusive or plexigenic lesion are very little. And you can imagine that this uh, in, uh, vessel stuffed with uh, cells is, is the cause of the pulmonary vascular obliteration. This is a low power magnification of some of one of our patients who had a lung transplant with methamphetamine associated PAH. And you can see similar characteristics at, at, a, uh, at a higher magnification. You can see that uh, it looks almost like plexigenic. There are types of pulmonary vascular disease that are post-capillary. This is called pulmonary venoocclusive disease, but it's not a focus of the conversation here. But what I did want to show you is this issue here, that here is a blood vessel at the time of autopsy, and uh, we see these uh, methyl cellulose um, uh, uh, artifacts within the pulmonary vasculature uh, from a patient who had a central line for one of our uh, therapies. I think this might have been either Benicio or my patient who was um, 
uh, basically using uh, intravenous methamphetamine cut with methyl cellulose. And, and these led to obliteration of the further obliteration of his pulmonary vasculature and ultimately death. Um, the big sort of uh, observation from our study was that uh, patients with um, methamphetamine associated pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension um, uh, have a worse long-term and even short-term outcome than idiopathic PAH cohort. You see the numbers at risk here are, are very small, certainly by, by 10 years, but by you know, the fifth year, you can see that um, survival at, for, for this um, cohort of patients um, after five years was less than 50% if they're methamphetamine users and uh, you know, much better uh, in idiopathics. Uh, certainly you would say this is still a very um, terrible disease, but, but it's one that we can demonstrate this event-free survival in. And as I mentioned to you before, um, I'm not showing the univariate uh, data, but uh, looking at uh, a priori multivariate uh, analyses, uh, we can show that the diagnosis of methamphetamine associated pH was associated with nearly twofold higher risk of uh, poor outcomes. And uh, we built based on what we just felt um, the model on other variables as well, gender, age, race, median household income, and access to um, uh, aggressive therapies. Our cohort was a cohort of both uh, prevalent and incident cases. When we looked at the multivariate analysis in incident only subjects with hard outcomes and meaning death only, not death and transplantation, we saw the same results. And what was very interesting, this is getting a little bit nitty gritty, but what was very interesting is uh, the proportion of patients that we use advanced intravenous um, uh, or uh, advanced prostacyclin therapies. These are, you know, therapies that require patients to be on pump 24-7, 365. We're offered more in our cohort to idiopathic patients over time than the methamphetamine patients. And that may be something that uh, we can, uh, we can uh, think about uh, in terms of um, why these patients have worse outcomes. Uh, in short, I could tell you that we we looked at, we did not find clinical confounders or mediators of worse outcome. There was a small nudge with a red uh, cell distribution width, and we sort of, you know, <sighs> poorly uh, uh, described this or hypothesized this as being maybe associated with some uh, degree of um, um, contaminants within the meth, maybe lead poisoning that would be associated um, with, with, uh, with this as a potential mediator, although it wasn't a very uh, substantial, uh, substantial one. You know, the issues that we have in our work and, and the potential opportunities working together are uh, from a clinical sense uh, are that it used to be that, you know, in the, in the era that we studied these methamphetamine exposures, these were not certainly pharmaceutical grade uh, drugs. These are local cooks and, and, and probably more recently, international crooks. Um, we didn't identify very well the route of administration or the length of exposure. And we recognize that uh, you know, addiction is, is something that is uh, maybe uh, multifactorial from, from the sense of um, different types of stimulants or other drugs and certainly opioids um, as well. And this is a, a case of a young woman who described um, her uh, uh, venture through uh, her addiction uh, with different routes and, and different, uh, different types of drugs. Um, the thing that brings us to this moment is, um, and we, we, we started this conversation with Steve and the colleagues at UCLA, is that uh, we have now, thanks to Steve's leadership, uh, Steve Kaywitz's leadership, uh, have funding from the NHLBI for a case control study of methamphetamine in PAH. Uh, which we started in September. Uh, we are uh, studying um, the disease across 10 centers at, in different geographic areas from here, the West Coast, uh, all the way to uh, the Midwest uh, to determine the association between methamphetamine and PAH, uh, carrying out a case control study of 210 incident patients versus 630 controls. Um, and um, 
this is a clinical uh, study which we're developing um, uh, survey questionnaires uh, for both patients and controls. But we also will be doing translational work um, and uh, study and um, uh, Venezia will tell you more about carboxyl esterase 1 and the association of uh, uh, CES1 and methamphetamine users with higher risk of, of pulmonary hypertension and understanding uh, some of the translational aspects of, of that. The grant for us is a huge opportunity to consider uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, a, an infrastructure for collaboration and submission of other grants around this. Um, we were chuckling at this idea. We even talked to some people about uh, collecting methamphetamine from patients to do uh, mass spec, uh, looking at uh, the serum uh, plasma um, uh, proteome and, and um, dual omics analyses. Uh, we've done a, a big study that I haven't mentioned here uh, on um, uh, using machine learning to identify signatures of inflammation in PAH, and we find that uh, patients with methamphetamine certainly have uh, signatures that are clinically relevant. Um, and, and other um, uh, ideas, I, I, ran, I had a patient of mine um, uh, just last week who actually wanted help with uh, her methamphetamine addiction. She's someone who is chronically fatigued from her pulmonary hypertension, but actively using because she needs the energy, she says, to take care of her mother. This is the same patient who actually gave me a bag of crystal meth a couple of months ago, and I had to get rid of that uh, very quickly without um, having any issues with it. But, but uh, I, I think, um, and I would leave Vinicio and uh, Steve, who are the uh, leads on this as well, to, to talk about possible other um, clinical and translational um, um, concepts that we can explore um, uh, on top of, of on top of this case control uh, study that we're uh, we're getting going. So, in general, I'll just uh, summarize that uh, we believe that methamphetamine-associated PAH patients have a poor prognosis that is not solely explainable by socioeconomic or educational differences may be related to differences in our red ventricular function at presentation, but not completely exact, exactly. We need to understand the idea of uh, non-adherence to medications and compliance with um, uh, avoiding substance abuse, which is, which is of, of interest uh, to us as well. And um, just as a point of reference, we have data from large registries now that even prescription uh, amphetamine-based stimulants uh, appear to increase the risk of pulmonary hypertension, but certainly not as high as methamphetamines. And, and um, the, our UCLA colleagues have educated us that stimulants um, when uh, at this dose uh, are used at much higher doses when, when they're uh, abused um, illicitly than prescription amphetamines. So with that, I'm glad to take your um, questions. This is our team that has led uh, this work along with Venezio and I. And, and Steve at, uh, at UPenn. Thanks for your attention. Questions? So I have one. Um, so, so 